Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to leave. He says, let not your heart be troubled. And they say to him, okay, but before you go, show us the Father. And Jesus says, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. My story today begins with a lady by the name of Helen. Now, my mother's name happens to be Helen, but it's not about me. The first Sunday when I went to my church in New York, after the service when people are leaving the church, a little lady comes up to me and she says, is it true that you studied at Le Brie in Switzerland? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did. And she said, by any chance, would you know my son? And she told me her son's name, and it didn't ring a bell to me. I did not know the name. And then I said to her, what does your son do now? I thought maybe he'd be a pastor or a professor. And she said, oh, he worships the Lord with his hands through baby." Now, worshiping the Lord with your hands is a Jewish theme throughout the Old Testament. It's also a theme that was picked up during the Reformation with Martin Luther and Calvin. But worshiping the Lord through your hands, through babies, that was a different expression for me. And as people came, I said goodbye to Helen, you know, and said hello to other people. That's the first time I met her. The second time, Early, as I just went to this church, my goal was to get to know the people. I mean, you, to minister, you have to know people. And so I gathered a group in our woman's parlor around the big fireplace, and I asked the question, very innocent question, what have you found in life that really excites you? What have you discovered in your living experiences that has brought you a lot of joy? What really turned you on in life? And little Helen's sitting in the front row, and she's the first one to raise her hand. And she said, I have seen the Lord grab hold of a life with so much strength and so much power that it absolutely frightened me. And she said, but at the very same time, it was sweet. Sweet, 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 sweet. Sweet Jesus. Now, I'm in my 20s. I'm a pastor, but that's a little more sweetness than I can handle. <laughs> I don't talk that way. So I was relieved when the gentleman sitting next to her said, oh my. He said, if I were the first one to respond, I would have said, garlic bread and Rheingold beer. <laughs> he said, there's something about that combination that just turns me on. I love it. And then we went around the room to different things. But I never went back to Helen to say, whose life? are you talking about that God has grabbed hold of? 
that left you with so much fear and so much sweetness. But I'll come back to her. A few weeks later, saying goodbye to people as they're leaving the church, and here comes Helen. So I said to her, Helen, how's your son? What's he doing? And she said, oh, he's on his way. I think it was Saudi Arabia, but it was in the Middle East somewhere. He's on his way to Saudi Arabia. The prince sent his plane for him to take some of his equipment and staff because the princess has a troubled pregnancy and there's, no, there's going to be something wrong with the baby. And as soon as the baby's born, he'll operate. And I said to myself, wow, you know, I know some physicians. I don't know physicians where a foreign country sends a plane to pick them up for the staff. And I didn't know you could operate on a brand new baby as soon as it's born. Like, wow. You know, and then I said hi to other people. You know, these are little segments going out of church. A few weeks later, dying of curiosity, she comes, and I said, what's your son doing now? And she said, oh, he's in Africa. He went to do surgery on a baby and concluded that they just didn't have the right equipment. So they're going to bring the baby to Philadelphia, but it takes, you have to do paperwork to bring people in for surgery. You know, I don't, I don't hang out with this crowd. I didn't know people went to foreign countries and did this kind of work. That's a whole new thing for me. That's a whole new way of looking at life. So she was never bragging about her son, but each time I saw her, I would say, now what? And she'd say, oh, he's lecturing at Yale University. Oh, he's lecturing at Cornell University. It was something dramatic every time I asked her. Like, wow. You know, what kind of a guy is this? And then she tells me that her son wants her to move to Philadelphia because she's getting elderly and he can't keep an eye on her in New York and it would be better if she lived closer. So she told me when she was moving, and it was either moving day or the day before. I stopped at her apartment to see her, and when I got there, her son was there with his wife, Elizabeth. And you could tell immediately he was the type of guy who was giving orders. I mean, he was standing in the middle of the apartment saying, Mom, you don't need that, and you don't need that, and we can give that away, you know, that type of person. Oh, my. And then his wife, Elizabeth, said, Now, honey, I think your mom would enjoy this. Why don't we let her decide? And then I realized he was just like the rest of us. Because you know what he said? Yes, dear. Yes, dear. <laughs> And when he said that, I was less intimidated by the guy. You know, he's kind of a big guy. And, you know, I don't know him other than more of his reputation and conversations with, with his mom. But he and his wife were delightful. And then I talked to Helen about her move. And she had friends that wanted to see her in Philadelphia. So I promised her that I would take some of her New York friends after she was settled and take them to go visit her in Philadelphia. And so I did. A couple months later, I piled my car with some of the church ladies, and we went off to Philadelphia to see Helen. And when we got there, I went in and gave my greetings, and then I left these women alone to play cards or do whatever they were doing, and then I went into the inner city where I had a friend that had just started a new uh, mission-type church, tiny little church, and when I got there, they were building a cinder block, I want to remember cinder block room, and they had about a dozen people from the church that were actually laying the bricks for this cinder block room. And when I got there, I said hi to my friends. It was like, what brings you to town? And I said, you know, I dropped this lady off. 
And I said, her husband is a physician around here. You ever hear of this guy? And as soon as I said that, the Spanish lady that was there said, oh, senor, she came running over to me. He saved my baby's life. He prayed for my baby. He prayed for me. He told me that, ejo, va, es mi pastor, nada me faltará. I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> she was Spanish, but she said it in English. She taught me that the Lord is my shepherd, that I shall not want, that I shall lack nothing. And then he prayed that he would find a way to solve this problem because lots of babies had the problem. And he did. And then he taught and he lectured all over the country so other surgeons would know how to do this surgery. So not only did my baby live, but hundreds if not thousands of babies have lived because of him. And that's why I'm in this church, she said. He taught me to trust God. And I am grateful to, and there was some gentleman there who was a nurse, who's the one that introduced her to this physician. And this nurse, male nurse, said to me, have you ever heard of a neonatal intensive care unit? I ask you, have any of you ever heard of a neonatal intensive care unit? Oh, many of you. Here's me. I'm telling you now, if you Take a look at your cover of the bulletin. For those of you who have had children, family, friends, anyone in a neonatal intensive care unit, you are indebted to that picture, and I will come back to that. For those of you who don't know, a neonatal intensive care unit takes care of tiny little babies. And I've seen babies in a neonatal unit that are no bigger than this. And he said to me, that physician designed the first neonatal unit in the world. And all neonatal units are from him. He said to me, in anesthetics, where you put someone to snuck they put someone to sleep, got the wrong term, anesthetist. He designed some of the medicines that are used to put little infants to sleep. He designed the tools for surgery for tiny babies. And I walked away saying, wow. I just walked in here saying that anybody ever hear of this guy and I'm walking away with an education. So I go back, pick up my church lady friends, and we drive back to New York. And about a year passed, maybe a little more, and I get this letter in the mail that looks, I mean, really official. It's got all those names and stuff, children's hospital, chief surgeon, all this. Letter, open the letter and it says, Dear Frank, as you know, because I corresponded with his mother, as you know, my mother's health is failing. Her blood pressure is this, and he gave me all the vital signs, which to me doesn't mean a thing. It means absolutely nothing. And then it says, based on my best calculations, my mother will die on Wednesday. Assuming that's correct, we could transfer the the body to New York on Thursday, and I'd like to reserve the church for a memorial service on Friday. If this is acceptable, please call my office to confirm. 
So I go to the church calendar, and as I'm writing it on the calendar, it dawns on me. I would be willing to bet, even today, that I am the only pastor in the entire world ever to reserve a church for a funeral while the person is still living. See, that doesn't happen. But it happened. She died on Wednesday. They transferred the body on Thursday. We had the service for her on Friday. And I heard a glorious testimony from her grandson and her son on their mother and grandmother's faith. And she was buried. And I figured that's the last time I'll obviously see her, think of her, say goodbye to the son, and I'll never see him again, etc. It was one of those different worlds. Now, three months later, opened up the New York Times. It was not only in the Times, it was in every newspaper, every television in the country. Surgeon separates, put together a team, separated Siamese twins, but generally joined, I think is the term, at the hip. Big article. Now the two twins are separated and doing well. And as I read the article, I'm reading it through Helen's eyes. And I'm saying to myself, if Helen could only see this, to have her son's picture all over TV, all over the New York Times. A couple months later, another article, surgeon puts together a team of people, separated, twins can generally join at the spine. And it lists the orthopedic surgeons and the neurologists and all the pediatric people. I said, wow. Separating people is one thing. Separating the hip is a miracle. Separating at the spine, that's incredible. I mean, I just I have trouble comprehending how anyone does that. What a marvelous thing that is. Several months have passed. There's another one. Only this was slightly different. It said, and I'm, as I recall, the twins were, it was the twins that were described as alive, but a life not consistent with living. And it described these two babies that had one heart. And the situation was the babies were going to die if nothing was done. Maybe if they did surgery, one of them would survive. And it described how this surgeon put together a team of rabbis, priests, Protestant clergy, attorneys, professors of ethics, and dealt with the issue, should we risk the surgery if one of these people is going to die? Are we killing one to save the other? If we do, is it the right thing to do? Will someone sue the hospital? And they got the hospital to sign off, the state signed off, and everybody agreed. And the decision as to which of the twins would live was the chief surgeon's call based on who had the greatest chance of survival. And so they separated the twins. One of them died, and the other one survived, the one that got the heart. And I said to myself, wow. And I keep thinking of this verse, greater things will you do? A few more months passed. Maybe a year or two. Ronald Reagan becomes president. And Ronald Reagan appoints 
Surgeon General for the United States. Now all surveys show that if you had to name one Surgeon General, you probably only know one. Anybody know any Surgeon General of the United States? Who? That one's name was Coop. C. Everett Coop. The C stands for Charles. No one called him Charles. His dearest friends all called him Chick, as in chicken coop. <laughs> I used to read sailing magazines, and one day I was reading a sailing magazine that had pictures of sailboats in the Virgin Islands, and it was this big sailboat, and the name on the sailboat you could see, and the name of the sailboat was chicken coop, and I immediately knew whose boat it was. Thus the picture of the hands with the dove for the Holy Spirit and chick. I never asked Helen who she referred to when she said she watched God get a hold of a life to such power and strength that it absolutely frightened her. But she found it sweet. Sweet, 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 sweet Jesus. I don't have to ask her. I know. There are about 125 children's hospitals in the U.S. About one third of those the chief surgeon was personally trained by C. Everett Coop. Why do I tell you this story? Part of me feels like I'm giving a eulogy to him. That's not my intent. My intent is this. When he died in February, it was in every newspaper in the country. It was on every TV in the country. It was on every internet site. There were little captions that went across the bottom, even on the financial news, that said, C. Everett Coop, Surgeon General, has died. Most people don't know all that he did before that. Most people have no idea how many babies Are alive today because of him. Many of the articles will say he was a man of great faith. But what they don't tell you is this. He came to the communion table And his response was to kneel at the altar and to say, Lord, you have given me my mind. You have given me these hands. You have given me passion for babies who have their whole life in front of them. Youth. I give it all back to you. Use it 
and I'll give you all the glory and the honor. All I want is to be a co-laborer in your work of creation. For those of you who have been to intensive care units for babies, You are indebted to this man. And this man will tell you, you are indebted to the Lord God Almighty who made us. I often use the expression, life helping life. In your life, you have life passing through you. We are not all going to be pediatric surgeons with world reputation. We're just people. But whatever you're doing in your life, as life passes through you, it is always life helping life. And I just ask that you see that, that God has given you something and it passes through you. Whether you are a surgeon, and we have surgeons, whether you're a pediatrician, we have those, whether you're an attorney, whether you're a musician, whether you're a cashier, whether you sell insurance, whatever it is that you are doing, life passes through you, and you are in a position to give it back so that whatever you do, you can do it for God's glory and God's honor as you co-labor in our work. Thank you for listening to my story. Our pastor will now lead us in our communion service. I'm going to invite everybody to turn to page 15 in your hymnal as we prepare the sacrament. <laughs> 